So Paul Williams is the Assistant Director of Pharmacy at, at Sunshine Coast uh, University Hospital. He is doing a PhD on the exact topic that he's talking on and uh, has done a lot of work in trying to understand what is a practical, a feasible um, approach to providing dose optimization in uh, in a university hospital. And uh, so he's done a lot of work in this area and he, um, he's he got some wonderful learnings, which I think that we'll all be really grateful to, to hear about. So thank you, Paul, and um, enjoy your presentation. All right, thanks, Jason. Uh, so yeah, this morning, uh, I'll be talking about different approaches to antimicrobial dose optimization. I'll be focusing on uh, three main uh, areas. So the outline of the presentation. So I wanna have a quick look at uh, what are the current dosing strategy options? And Jason has touched on a few of these already. Uh, an overview of these strategies. Uh, what evidence do we have to support the strategies that I'll go over? Uh, also just want to touch on what the current practice in Australia and internationally is through survey results of what people are doing on the floor. And then just to summarize, uh, just a consideration of which dosing strategy may be most suitable for yourself in clinical practice. So we'll make a start. Uh, I won't really touch on this as Jason's already uh, covered it. Uh, but if you look over the third here, we're basically looking at methods to in general overcome pharmacokinetic uh, modifications to optimize um, dosing. So what are our current options? Firstly, you can follow your product information. Uh, most of what I'll talk today is regarding critically ill patients. So that's, as a general practice, is probably not the most suitable approach. Uh, you can move on to just the clinician's choice. Um, and obviously in any profession, uh, it's down to their knowledge and expertise. And there's gonna be some people that are well suited to, to um, decide on the best approach. Uh, but I know from my own practice, there are a lot of uh, junior doctors that, that prescribe in this area who, who don't have a great um, background and knowledge in this area. So uh, again, it's probably not the, the best option moving forward. Um, as Jason uh, touched on, prolonged infusions uh, is definitely for the right antibiotic where we're targeting time above MIC uh, is absolutely a great approach. And, and that can be incorporated into the following three approaches, which I will discuss in a little more detail. Firstly, will be guideline based dosing. Uh, secondly, therapeutic drug monitoring and then dose optimization. So therapeutic drug monitoring, but incorporating uh, Bayesian modeling uh, to optimize that further. So let's start with guideline based dosing or dosing nomograms. So what is that? It, it's basically providing uh, dosing regimens and, and generally this is based on specific parameters. Uh, so for the patient it will, it will generally be their age or weight, most commonly, we're looking at their renal function, uh, degrees of renal impairment, or the flip of that, so augmented renal clearance. Uh, this approach is, is, is absolutely not the most individual approach. Uh, and as I'll mention later, it's probably considering your practice, what infrastructure you have, uh, and maybe this approach is quite feasible dependent on those considerations. When nomograms are created, uh, they're generally done via two approaches and most commonly is through uh, modeling uh, and simulation, or the alternative is to go through the primary literature and then uh, assess that based on either evidence of target attainment or in some cases, uh, clinical outcome data based on a specific uh, target attainment. And as I mentioned, it, it can be a feasible option compared to TDM and dosing software. And I'll touch on that a little, a little more. This is just an excerpt from uh, at the SCU ICU I work. And this is sort of our guideline that, that we use just to give you a, a sense of one, one uh, version of this. So you can see here, we've got your standard dosing. We've got considerations for suspected augmented renal clearance and in what situation you would consider that. If we are gonna give an extended infusion, what dosing we would use. Uh, and we also just have some extra information in regards to distribution or penetration in the site of the infection. And then some information on the MIC and the PKPD indice, which is the time above MIC in this case. So what's the evidence for guideline-based dosing? Well, it is pretty limited. 
Uh, to date, most studies in this area are looking at, at bundles of care, uh, which in, could incorporate, for example, empiric dosing of what, what drug to actually use for a specific indication. Uh, so it, it's very hard to determine which elements of the bundle are leading to the outcomes that they have measured. Uh, in terms of guidelines and why they might be feasible, which I've mentioned, uh, information from survey results, some of the reasons why guidelines could be beneficial. Uh, firstly, respondents talk about resources for dose recommendations are, are lacking and that there's a large variation in the source of information that can be accessed by clinicians. Uh, there's a sense that TDM is not readily available at certain sites. Uh, and also, even if it is available, many sites find that it's delayed and its application uh, clinically uh, is difficult. Uh, and then when you do get that result, interpreting the TDM to guide further dosing is also another challenge. Uh, and other challenges that respondents do um, mention are MICs that are not routinely uh, reported. So just to touch on just a couple of quick um, examples of guidelines. Uh, this one here is empiric uh, dosing of antibiotics for, for VAP, and this included the choice of antibiotic and also the dosing of the antibiotics. It was a interrupted time series, so uh, before and after. Before was just clinician's choice of antibiotic selection and dosing. And then they used local MIC distributions and Monte Carlo simulations to determine which antibiotic to use for VAP and what dose to use. Their primary outcome was infection-related mortality. And in this study, they found mortality in the before group was 21.6, which went to 8.5%, which is uh, fairly significant. The authors concluded uh, that they had lower infection-related mortality, reduced length of stay, and fewer superinfections. Uh, this study, it wasn't adequately powered for that primary outcome, but the results are very interesting nonetheless. Uh, and I just want to touch on just one other, which is the continuous infusion of meropenem for critically ill uh, gram negative uh, infections in critically ill patients, sorry. Uh, and with this one, when they developed the nomogram through Monte Carlo simulations, they were targeting a concentration of eight to 12 of meropenem. So we're looking at say uh, four to six times MIC, so fairly ag aggressive. Uh, and if you look down the bottom right in the plot here, you can see in the study that they did in 56 patients, they compared the observed concentration in patients receiving um, dosing of meropenem according to the dosing nomogram and the prediction as per the nomogram. And you can see here, uh, pretty good correlation there. Uh, we've got an R value of 0.92. Uh, so, Without the need of uh, TDM or drug concentrations, you, uh, you can see that there's a pretty good correlation between the, uh, the uh, nomogram and the predicted and the actual observed concentration, uh, which I guess supports if you don't have that infrastructure to do TDM, that this is probably a feasible approach. Let's move on to TDM, which uh, I won't spend too much time because as Jason said, there's probably going to be many talks that go into this in more detail. So traditionally, it's looked uh, being used for antimicrobials to avoid toxicity and aminoglycosides, glycopeptides. And obviously the contemporary application is more about achieving concentrations that maximize the likelihood of positive outcomes. Uh, as I've said before, there are barriers to this approach. We've spoken about uh, access to assays, the turnaround time, access of MIC data for a given pathogen. One that we haven't spoken about is the optimal concentration target. So you really need to know that PKPD indice. Uh, you need to know what the MIC is or what the worst case scenario MIC is. Uh, and that's going to help you guide what your target is. Is it 100% above um, free time above MIC? Is it four times that? And then probably very important as well is how you make the dose adjustments based on your expertise. Do you use a validated uh, dose optimization software? So just to touch again on just a couple of studies. So Wong et al. in 2018, this is looking at beta lactam unbound concentrations in over 300 critically ill patients. So firstly, using uh, their empiric dosing, uh, which is clinician's choice, 
when they're aiming for a target of 100% free time above MIC, they found that a third of patients, the 33.1%, required a dose increase when they had taken their first level. And if they were aiming for the more aggressive target of four times MIC, they found that nearly two thirds required a dose adjustment or a dose increase, sorry. Uh, in terms of adjusting following TDM, they uh, didn't find any difference in patients achieving concentrations after that dose adjustment. So I guess that starts to raise the question about the effectiveness of dose adjustment schedules. And um, I guess if you're just using 2D TDM without dose optimization software, it's questions of if my target is four and I get a level of two, do I double the dose? Uh, just um, I guess using the dose optimization software provides a more sort of robust approach of how you would modify the dosing versus just doubling or halving, uh, which in the literature to date hasn't shown to be uh, maybe the most effective um, a method. So these findings of, of uh, achieving 100% free time above MIC of about 60 uh, two thirds, that that's aligns with a lot of the studies that, that I have read uh, to date in this space. So overall from TDM studies, uh, we know that there's definitely variability in the target concentrations that have been achieved. There's still uncertainty of what is the optimal target and that still remains uh, today, depending on the antibiotic. Uh, and we do know that empiric dosing, just using clinician driven dosing, it, it's not achieving those desired targets at this point. So TDM can correct over and under dosing uh, to get it closer to, the, to, to where you're aiming for, but uh, further investigations into more eloquent methods such as dose optimization uh, software are required. So that moves us to dose optimization software and this will be discussed in more details later. Uh, this little figure here is pretty much just to show that there's, I guess there's two, two parts of it. There's a population PK sample. There's applying a mathematical model to that to uh, create your final model. And then you're really applying the individual patient's data, uh, which you can see there may be um, their weights, their creatinine clearance, what their TDM is to date, their concentrations, and then using Bayesian forecasting to predict uh, what dose may be required or what concentration may, be, may you would predict based on a specific dose. And just briefly to touch on uh, studies to date in this space. Uh, so uh, in this study, again, we're looking at beta-lactams and critically ill patients and they used a dose optimization software, IDODS, uh, looking at around 50 patients for meropenem, kefepime or piptaz. And what they found using this dosing software that when they were targeting either a trough level, you can see here 96% achieved that trough. And if you remember just with the uh, straight TDM approach, we're looking around that 65 to 70%. So that's fairly encouraging. Or well, they had drug specific uh, targets, which you can see down the bottom here. Uh, so I guess that's probably the biggest take home from there that there was, there was actually quite an increase by using this in terms of patient outcomes from this approach that that's still um, the evidence to support that is still uh, fairly limited. And I wanted to just touch on this neat little paper from Neely et al in 2018. And this was looking at AUC guided vancomycin using dose optimization software and versus it was more therapeutic than using trough concentrations. It was a study over three years uh, in 250 patients. In the first year, they just used uh, trough concentrations and clinician driven dosing aiming for 10 to 20. In year two to three, they're aiming for an AUC over MIC of above 400, below 800. Uh, the difference between year two and year three, in year three with this software, which was the best dose, they used an optimized uh, timing of taking your samples uh, to which the software uh, could, I guess, really narrow in what uh, the predictions would be. So what they found that 19% uh, of all trough concentrations were actually therapeutic when you looked at, um, sorry, were were therapeutic versus if you looked at the AUC versus M over MIC ratio that 70% of them were therapeutic. So there's a bit of a difference there. So when the AUC target was achieved, they found that uh, a corresponding trough of less than 10 was observed in 
of patients and a trough below 15 in 68% of patients. They found with an AUC model um, over MIC using dose optimization software that they reduced length of stay, nephrotoxicity, and the blood sampling um, was reduced. Patient outcomes were similar. I just wanted to show the violin plots here. So this first year, you can see we're looking at AUC over MIC, and you can see quite a range here. Uh, it's, it's fairly flat. We go to the second year using the dose optimization software, you can start to see this widening around the 400 to 500 mark. And as I said, in the third year, when they use the optimal timing uh, aspect of the software, you can see this nice section here at four to 500. So that's um, very promising for dose optimization software approach. In summary, regarding dose optimization software, I think there's lots of PK models that are very suitable for clinical application. Uh, validation of the commercial products that are available in clinical space and looking at patient specific outcomes. I think that's still, uh, you know, work in progress uh, and fairly limited at this point. Finally, I, I just want to touch on just a couple of uh, surveys just to see what, what are people doing in, in practice currently. So this one's just in Australia that was this year. Uh, looking at 85 Australian hospitals, not ICU specific, just hospital uh, wide. Uh, and respondents, there was a quarter of respondents that uh, said that they didn't have guidelines to advise TDM ordering, sampling or interpretation for, for any of their agents. Uh, around half of respondents said that it was the admitting team's responsibility to order and interpret TDM, and there was no, I guess, specialist uh, advice in this area. Uh, this was, um, sorry, that, sorry, that was incorrect. The admitting team was responsible for the ordering interpretation, and there wasn't anything specific. But the fifty percent was access to dose optimization software, and that was higher you can see here in principal referring sites or children's hospital respondents where it was 100%. They did look at clinical vignettes uh, to see uh, regarding uh, TDM and dosing of vancomycin, gentamicin and voriconazole versus the current guidelines. Uh, and you can see here we have very low uh, alignment with current guidelines, uh, which seems to suggest that, you know, the, the latest guidelines are evidence. It's, it's not really translating to practice at this stage in saying that some of these for the vancomycin, that was a fairly recent update. So they're um, having time to take that into practice and doing an AUC based um, therapy. Uh, it's probably reasonable that that hasn't occurred across the board. And just finally, the last international study of TDM utilization, and this is looking at critically ill patients, was done in 2015. Uh, you can see we've got uh, many respondents uh, through 52 countries, 328 hospitals, and they looked at clinical vignettes again to determine loading doses, total doses, infusion duration. Uh, there was a large variation in dosing administration and monitoring. The bottom left here, you can see the majority when we're looking at vancomycin, piptaz and carbapenems, that intermittent infusions were um, what most um, places were using. And if we go to the bottom right, this is difficult to see, but in the black here, it's where all patients receive TDM. So for vancomycin, you can see it's around that 75%. So in 2015, when you look at beta-lactams, um, so Piptaz here and carbapenem, we're looking more of that one to two percent utilization. Um, so this is you know five years ago now. It'd be interesting to see how that has um, changed uh, in recent times. So finally, and just to summarize, probably worth starting to think in your own practice what what is most suitable. The goal we want to achieve maximize therapeutic concentrations throughout that dosing course and as i've touched on it's really dependent on your infrastructure uh, and the expertise available to perform tdm if we're looking at empiric dosing if you if you do not have access to tdm then i think guidelines is uh, a, a valid feasible option you can also use a priori dosing from dose optimization software that doesn't require any levels. And we can we'll discuss that in a later session. And then once you have started dosing, then you can use dosing nomograms and just adjust according to things such as uh, renal function.
If you do have the luxury of, of TDM, then a priori dosing using dosing software to predict the empiric dosing seems like a reasonable approach. Then moving on to TDM plus the clinician's uh, adjustment of, a, of uh, dosing would be an option. And I think the bottom right of using TDM plus dose optimization software bays and modeling um, is probably the, the optimal approach. Uh, but as I said previously, the um, literature to support this in terms of patient outcomes is, is uh, not available to date. So that concludes my talk. There's some references there for your information, but um, if there are any questions, I'll hand back over to Jason. Thank you. Well, thanks, Paul. I hope you can hear me. That was, uh, that was fantastic. Uh, we have one question for you from Michelle Cree, uh, which is, did you look into loading doses or use of loading doses for optimization? Do right. you want to make a comment on that, Paul? So, did I look into loading doses for optimization? Uh, is this referring to sort of the guideline approach or just? Maybe if you could just give a general comment about what you think about use of loading doses for, for dose optimization of antimicrobials. And... Yeah, so I guess it depends on the, on the agent, obviously. I, I guess the obvious one is, is vancomycin. I'll touch on that later, especially from a dose optimization software perspective and some of the models being able to incorporate the loads or not include that. So that's definitely incorporated. Uh, and in terms, depending on what approach you're doing, from my perspective and the guidelines that I've used, uh, definitely when we're going straight to a continuous infusion, then we tended to use a load prior to commencing the continuous infusion. Uh, other than that, in uh, beta-lactams and without the load prior to continuous infusion, I, I probably don't have any more to add or evidence to support standard loading doses. Fantastic, thanks very much, Paul.